Good evening, everybody. <clears throat> glad that you could, we're so glad you could join us tonight live on this virtual revival called The Cure. And uh, we're excited. I believe this is day number three, night number three. Big thanks to Pastor Jack Osteen, not just for hosting this or, or putting this out there, but a big thanks to Pastor Jack for obeying the voice of the Lord in doing this. And the Lord really put it in his heart for us to do something, to preach, to share the Word of God every night. Not just a sermonette, but an actual Word from heaven. And that is what people needed in this hour was a word from heaven. And so if you're just now tuning in, or if you're watching the recording, would you do us a favor? Would you, if, if you're watching from the Cure page, would you just hit that share button and share it to your page and then also start a watch party to involve, get people, some people, maybe some people involved in watching this revival and maybe it can expand the borders of this revival to be able to to minister to a lot of different people. If you're watching from my Facebook page tonight, I've actually got this going uh, for, live from the Revival page as well as my own personal private Facebook page. So if you're watching from my personal page, would you please hit that share button as well and also start a watch party because we want this revival to touch as many people as possible. Not just because I'm preaching tonight. You're going to be seeing me also share this on my personal page. Night after night, I'll be doing a watch party at 7 p.m. nightly. This, this is a crucial time in the world, in our nation, in America. Uh, I think we've got people tuning in from other nations, other countries. And so there's a lot of things going on in the world right now. And we need to know what heaven is saying about our time in which we live. And so tonight, <clears throat> please hit that share button. Start that watch party. Invite some people to join you in your watch party. Let's make this a group effort. Let's get some different people involved to hear the word of the Lord. I'm so excited because Pastor Jack messaged me the other day. I think it was Sunday afternoon. says, hey, do you have a word? And I said, well, I don't really necessarily have a particular one, but I do know how to get one. And so he, he said, well, all right, you're up for Tuesday night. And so it's interesting that that night, Sunday night, I couldn't sleep. And uh, sometimes I, I don't sleep. I don't just lay awake in my bed at night and just not sleep. When I'm having one of those nights, I usually get up, go pray, do something. So I went down to our living room, couldn't sleep, couldn't get settled. And then the word of the Lord, the voice of the Lord came to me. And I know that tonight that I'm sharing a word from heaven for you tonight. I'm believing God to touch many lives tonight. And so what I want to do is I want us to pray I want wherever you're at, I want you to lift your hands. Maybe you need to fall to your knees. Maybe you need to get on your face. Put the phone down. Get on your face. And let's begin to call upon Jesus for this revival, for this time together. So we pray right now, Father, in the name of Jesus. God, we beseech heaven right now. God, we're asking, Lord, not just for another word, but the voice of the Lord to come to us today. I'm asking, Father, that we wouldn't hear with a natural ear. We wouldn't have natural wisdom and understanding. But, God, we would have an ear to hear what the Holy Spirit is saying. And that, God, you would break up the fallow ground of our hearts right now in this moment. Prepare our hearts, God. Prepare our hearts. Prepare our minds, Lord, to receive the word of God. Prepare our insight. God, give us insight this year, 2020. May we see things clearly, God. I pray, Father, that the enemy has blinders over our minds and our eyes so we cannot see, that the Holy Spirit would crush, smash, and destroy those blinders, that the eyes of our understanding would be enlightened tonight. I pray it in the name of Jesus. We ask, amen and amen. So we're going to get right into the Word of God. And if you haven't already, hit that share button and start a watch party. And so if you have a Bible by you or you're able to go on some other electronic device to be able to pull up the Word of God, we're going to go to the book of 1 Kings 18. 1 Kings 18. Tonight, I don't know if I'm going to necessarily preach for a long time. I don't think I have a very long word, but I do believe I have a very strong word. I just want to really encourage you to not just tune in tonight, but tune in tomorrow night. I'm not supposed to tell you who's preaching tomorrow night because Pastor Jack asked 
to not share that. He doesn't want everybody knowing who's going to preach night in and night out. So what, we're going to keep that a secret. But I know who's preaching. I actually spoke with this brother this afternoon. And you do not want to miss tomorrow night. I don't know who's coming the next night or the night after that. But you do not want to miss tomorrow night. So hit that share button. Let's share it, get into the Word of God together. 1 Kings chapter 18. 1 Kings chapter 18. We're going to read verse number 1 and verse number 1 only. Thank you, Father. As I read this word, maybe if you want to stand to your feet or whatever, but would you just lift your hand as an open sign to receive the word of the Lord tonight? I'll be reading from the New American Standard Version of the Bible. It says... Now it happened after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah. I'm going to stop right there and I'm going to back up and I'm going to read that again. And now it happened. My God, I feel the anointing. Now it happened. Anybody ready for something to happen tonight? Now it happened after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go show yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain on the face of the earth. Tonight I want to preach a message that I'm going to entitle, The Voice. The Voice. Lift your hands to the Lord again. I'm going to preach on the voice. Lift your hands again. I'm going to ask God to speak to you again. Father, make your word plain. Make it clear. Give us insight and understanding and an ear to hear tonight that we may hear, God, a voice from heaven. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen and amen. I'm kind of... In my office, I don't really have a pulpit tonight. I got my desk is way over here and I got a little couch right here. So I'm kind of setting my notes on my couch. Just a few things the Lord just began to speak to me. Even in the last 30 minutes, I have Pastor Jack text me earlier and he's like, I'm praying for you right now. And I'm like, brother, I can feel it because you have no idea all the things that's coming to me that I can't even process right now. I couldn't even write everything down uh, that was coming to me. But I'm going to preach to you tonight about the voice. And it's interesting that the Lord had me title this message, The Voice, because I have talked a lot about the power of a voice. And not in preaching. I haven't been preaching this. But something I do outside the ministry is I'm a health coach, and I begin to train up and teach other health coaches. And one of the things that I've taught them is that when you're supporting people, you don't just need to text them. You actually need to pick up the phone and call them. When you're sharing our health program and the benefits of health with people, don't just text them the information. Why would I tell them not to do that? Because people need to hear your voice. There is something different about when you actually write something down and send somebody a letter versus actually that person hearing your voice. It's one thing to know somebody through that which they have written on paper, but it's another thing when you actually get in the presence of somebody and you hear their voice for yourself. Because there is a heartbeat, there is a release in the spiritual realm whenever you come into contact and hear someone's voice. Isn't that what the Pro book of Proverbs alludes to? That when we hear somebody's voice, we need to be, or when we speak, we need to be careful what we say because life and death is in the power of the tongue. In other words, the voice brings power. And we were talking the other day, this la last week when Pastor Jack called me and was sharing his heart about potentially doing this revival and what God was putting in him. This idea began to be discussed between he and I about preachers that are preaching and what they're preaching. And he said something that I knew to be true but really hit home with me. And in the previous night's of revival that he spoke or shared, you might have even heard this, but we began to talk about how there's many preachers who are preaching for God but are not preaching from God. 
I'm going to say that again. There are preachers who are preaching for God, but not preaching from God or with God. Can I tell you that there are many preachers who are preaching the word of the Lord, but are not yet preaching in a way that brings forth the voice of God? Can I tell you, you can have a sermon and not necessarily have the voice of God. You can preach the pages of the Bible. But there's one thing to preach when the pages of the Bible and from what you receive and study versus the very thing that you've heard in a prayer closet called the voice of the Lord. And here's the scripture I read tonight in 1 Kings 18. It's interesting to me that the Bible says that after many days, the word of the Lord came to Elijah. The word of the Lord came to Elijah. It's one thing to preach a word of God and then a word from the Lord. Can I tell you that in this time, in this season, in this quarantine, we have people preaching. We have people sharing things from God. But I have found that not many are preaching from heaven. They're just preaching for heaven. We need to hear what God is saying in the moment. You know, in this ministry culture, in this church culture, we are taught to build ministry fast. We are taught to find the quicker and easier way to do things. Steal other people's sermons. Get what their input is. Look in commentaries. Look in concordances. Do all these things and make sure that you have everything right so you can communicate the best message so that you can make the best amount of your time. Don't spend as much time studying. You can cut your hours of study doing this and doing that. And by doing all those things, what we have actually done is learn how to just preach for God instead of preaching from what we've heard from God. And this is what the Lord showed me here in 1 Kings 18, that it was after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah. I'm about to preach something that I believe is going to be a new dynamic. Well, I've mainly just been preaching and saying ministries preaching, churches preaching, because I feel like the word I have may not necessarily be just for any person that calls himself a believer, but there are ministers who are going to hear this. There are pastors who are going to hear this. There are evangelists who are going to hear this, and you need to get back to hearing the voice and quit preaching for God and preach from God. And can I tell you that a genuine word of the Lord, when you've really heard the voice of God and shared the message from His voice versus just for His voice, when you've really had the voice of God, it does not cam come in a short span of time. It doesn't come just necessarily quickly and without digging into the deepness of, God, of, of God's presence in prayer. It was after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah. So this is what we have today. We have people that are trying to do everything else in ministry versus dedicating themselves to the ministry of the word and of prayer. We have shortened our study time. We have shortened our prayer time to just get a sermonette that fits in our sermon series so we always have something new to preach every single week. Somebody is going to get into a new dynamic tonight. Somebody's going to get liberated from having to always produce a new thing as in a performance based. Listen, we got to quit worrying about always preaching something new for people. What if God wanted you to put the brakes on and instead of always trying to come up with a new sermon for the next week for the sermon series, what if God had you to regurgitate something week after week after week until your people finally got it? The church is the only educational institution where review is frowned upon. The moment the pastor begins to sound repetitive in his message, and the moment the evangelist begins to repeat the same message over and over again, we begin to label that person. Could it be that the person shouldn't be labeled somebody who doesn't know how to hear a fresh word from heaven? Could it be that that person actually is hearing from heaven, and heaven doesn't want him to preach anything else other than what he's been preaching week after week? 
Can I tell you that a true word from God will come after many days? It's many days of prayer. It's many days of laying on your face. It's many days of getting in the Word. Listen, we have spent many days in ministry going to the hospitals, going to the nursing homes, going to check on this person, going to check on that person, going to the bank and doing this, going to take on this business endeavor for the church, and we not, and the pastor has totally neglected the prayer closet. Well, my friend, you might be saying, Brother Gray, it's easy for you to say because you're not a pastor. Maybe it is easy for me to say, but can I tell you what your most important task as a ministry leader is. It's not, and I'm speaking to evangelists too, it's not building your social media platform. It's not your YouTube channel. It's not making sure that you keep brother so-and-so in church so they don't leave and take their tithes. It's that you get on your face for many days and don't you leave that office carpet. Don't you leave that place of prayer. Don't you leave that place of study until you know you have His voice. Can I tell you that I have seen it in my life where people would say as an evangelist, what do you do between weeks when you maybe you only have a, a service to preach on a Sunday? I'll tell them exactly what I do. As I told them, I used to go into my office for eight hours a day, sometimes three to five days a week until I knew I heard his voice. Some would call that lazy. Some would call that a lack of time. But can I tell you the times where I did not spend enough days in prayer, in study, and in fasting to hear His voice. The ministry that took place that week or weekend was not very fruitful. Listen, apart from me, you can do nothing, Jesus said. The way we get connected to the vine, the way we produce fruit, the way we learn to have His voice and hear His voice and replicate His voice is when we have stayed with Him for many days. Notice something. It wasn't just a couple of days like in the week like I just talked about. It said after many days in the third year, that's when the word of the Lord came to Elijah. You want to hear his voice? You really? Preacher, evangelist, pastor, apostle, prophet, whatever label, whatever gift you have, whatever way you function, can I tell you that it takes years of the prayer closet, years of seasons of fasting, years of study until you fine-tune your ear to be qualified as a voice to the body. Can I tell you that it takes years to really get qualified to really have the word of the Lord. Many people are preaching, but they don't have the word of the Lord. Why? Because they have not given themselves to the years of sacrifice and prayer and fasting that is necessary to carry God's voice. See, Elijah, three years before, he had given a word. And that's that the heavens would be shut up and no rain would come from heaven except by his word. And so for three years, before he brings the next word of God, the next voice of God, guess where he's at? He is going into a place called the wilderness. And he goes by a brook. And God commands the ravens to feed him. And the, then he moves from the wilderness into the rain, from the ravens feeding him to going into the widow's home and the widow preparing things for him and taking care of him. Can I tell you that whenever God gets ready to use you as a voice, He will always send you into the wilderness. He will always send you into the wilderness. God's voice does not come by comfort. It does not come by giving yourself to pleasure. It does not come any other way than when God sends you through a wilderness season where you can't feel Him, where it seems like you can't hear Him. It was three years between the time where Elijah heard the word of the Lord. There is a season where God takes you through something where it beats everything in you that needs to come in, out of you, out of you. Can I tell you, the wilderness is the place where God crucifies a man and strips him of himself and qualifies him to be a voice. Why did it take three years for Elijah to get another word of the Lord to deliver it? Can you imagine that? Your pastor getting a word on one Sunday and he doesn't preach again for another three Sundays because he doesn't have the voice of the Lord? What if we begin to just get into the presence of God 
and wait until the man of God really has unction instead of waiting for him just to recurgitate something for the sake of our entertainment needs. Some of you right now that are not pastors and ministers, your lay people, your church attenders, you treat your pastor like an entertainer. You treat him like a circus clown where if he doesn't preach good enough, if he doesn't say the right things, if he doesn't make you feel good, or if he doesn't step on your toes enough and get red face and preach like the evangelist does. What if, what if, what if, my friend, what if? What if we quit treating the man of God like some sort of stage performer and we actually honored him as the preacher and the prophet of God that he's called to deliver the word of the Lord. And we would be understanding and mature enough to give him the time that he needs to get into God's presence, whether it's from Sunday to Sunday or Sunday three weeks from now, to know that he's got the voice of the Lord. It takes the man of God having the voice of the Lord. And God will take a man... Now I'm back to talking to the preachers again. God will take you through a season where He will beat you. He will cause things and pressures and situations to cause you to be stripped of your own ability. He will cause you to be stripped of your own reliability upon yourself to where when God does use you as a voice, you can't take any credit for it except for your Self, except for God Himself. Listen here, my friend, tonight. If some of you are going through the wilderness, you're going through trying times, you don't know why this is happening or that is happening. But let me tell you, instead of trying to escape the wilderness, embrace the wilderness. The quicker you can embrace the wilderness, the quicker you can embrace the crucifixion, the quicker you can embrace that thing that God's trying to do in you, and it'll be the quicker you go from that season to the next where you will move into the widow's house. Oh my goodness, can I tell you that even in the wilderness, when you go through a wilderness, God brings you into a place that is more comfortable and more conducive for you to get into a place of prayer and hear the word of God. There is a place. See, God doesn't just take you through the ringer and then throw you out to the wolves in ministry while you're dead, beaten, tired. He takes you through a season of rest where you can make sure that there is provision for you and that there's a place where you can hear the voice of God. And then, once he goes to the wilderness, once he goes to the widow's house, once he has the voice of God again, he comes out and he says, gather all the prophets of Baal. He tells Ahab, you're the one that's troubled Israel. He tells the people when they gather, how long will you hesitate between two opinions? He preaches the word of the Lord. The fire comes down. And when Elijah, before the fire comes down, Elijah says, God, all these things I've done, where I've made the altar, I've cut up the wood, I've cut up the ox, I've prayed, I've done all these things at your word. And the fire fell because Elijah had a voice. How important is it to have the voice of God? How important is it for us to really know that we have heard from heaven? I can tell you it is very, very important. Because anytime God uses anybody, He seems to always do it through a voice. We have a ministry ideology that we've got to meet people's needs. That we just got to feed them, we just got to clothe them, we just got to take care of the physical needs. And that is a part of ministry. But can I tell you, it in no way eliminates the need for a man to lift up his voice. The power of the gospel is in the preaching of the gospel, not in the demonstration of it through meeting physical needs. The apostle Paul said that there was foolishness in the preaching of the gospel, but it was the power of God for salvation. We have got to get back in trusting in the power of the preaching of someone who has had the voice of the Lord will declare the word of the Lord. Why are people so afraid right now? Because there's no faith. They're full of fear. And could it be they have no faith? It's because they have not really heard a word from God. What is being said about our situation? What is being said from heaven? When you know a word has been preached from heaven, it burns within you. Can I tell you how important the voice of the Lord is? Is if you go all the way back To Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning it says that God created the heavens and the earth, but yet the earth 
was formless and void. My God, the earth was formless and void. And after that, in verse number three, it says, and God said, let there be light. Then you go into verse four and verse five, and you keep going on through the rest of the chapter one. And it keeps saying, then God said, let this be. God said, let this be. God said, let this be. The voice of God comes and that which is without form and is void only begins to have substance once the voice of God comes. Can I tell you how important it is to have the voice of God and preach from the voice of God? Is this. It's because even that thing which God has created does not have any value. It is void until the voice of God comes into it. Listen here. The earth was formless and void and did not begin to be filled with anything, any form or fashion until the voice of God came into it. Can I tell you why our churches are empty and void of substance? It's maybe because in our churches we have preachers who are not preaching from his voice. Well, Brother Grady, hold on a minute. You said the earth was out form and void and God didn't create anything. God didn't frame anything. God didn't fill anything until his voice come. But don't you know what Hebrews 11 verse 3 says? It says that from God's voice, from his word, that the universe, the earth, was framed, formed, or created. Yes, in Hebrews 11.3, it does say that God created the universe. He created this world. He created these things by His voice. However, when you go into the Greek language and you begin to understand that when God is saying that word, the word we've translated created or formed or fashioned, if you go into the Greek, you will find that the original meaning did not necessarily mean created. We have translated it as created. What it actually means when it says God created or formed the universe through the word of his power, what that means in the Greek is that God completed it thoroughly. In other words, there was something that was there, but it wasn't complete. So the universe was completed thoroughly by his word, by his voice. So if you go back, to Genesis 1, there in God in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was formless and void, but then it was filled, it was completed thoroughly when he brought his voice. Why is the church incomplete? Why is the church not formed and fashioned the way it should be? It's because men and women of God have forgotten the preachers of this day and age have forgotten that the cure, the cure, the cure, the answer is us releasing the voice of the Lord. You know, the scripture says in 2 Timothy 3 verse 5 that there are people who will hold to a form of godliness but will deny its power. Hold on a minute. There will be people in the last hour that will hold to a form of godliness but yet will deny the power. Where does the power come from? Because the people have a form, but yet there's no power. Where does the power come from? It comes from the people of God that have encountered a voice through the man of God. Preacher, are you preaching? I'm going to say it again. Are you preaching for God or are you preaching from God? Do you have His voice? Because this form of godliness... Guess what? It was demonstrated in 1 Kings 18. Elijah didn't demonstrate it, but the prophets of Baal did. It says that when Elijah gave them the challenge to make the sacrifice, that they would cut up one ox and he'd cut up the other and they would, you know, they would call down fire and the one, the the, the God that answers by fire, he is God. And they began to do everything Elijah told them to do. They made an altar. They, they, they leaped about that altar. The Bible actually says they danced about the altar. They shouted. Hold on. Whoa, wait a minute. I'm seeing a picture here. They shouted and they danced. Wow. Okay. So some of the people that call themselves Pentecostal right now that think I'm just preaching about these, the other churches don't claim to the power of God. I'm talking to the Assembly of God Pentecostal Charismatic Church that has the shout, that has the dance. And you know what else the prophets of Baal did? It says they raved until the evening, the time of the evening sacrifice. Do you know what that word rave means? It means they frantically prophesied. Whoa! Check that out. It says that they shouted, 
they danced, and they frantically prophesied. My God. However, guess what the Bible says? But there was no voice. There was no voice. They danced. They shouted. They prophesied. They even cut themselves and blood was going everywhere. And there was no voice. They had the religious show. They had the form. I'm afraid that in this hour in which we live, we have the form like the prophets of Baal. Our church services look more like the prophets of Baal spectacle. That's what we do is we kick up the dust and congratulate ourselves in the show, but yet there has never been a voice to bring about change. They leaped, they shouted, they danced, they prophesied, yet no life was changed because there was no voice. But Elijah was a man who had a word from heaven. And he declared it and he did everything that God told him to do. And when he did that, the fire of God fell. Interesting enough that when the fire of God fell, the Bible not only says that it consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifice and the dust and the stones and the wood, but it licked up the water that was in the trench. It licked up the water that was in the trench. Let me ask you this. If tonight you were to leave here and go get you an ice cream cone from McDonald's, how would you eat that ice cream cone? Some of you take a bite of it. Most of you would do this. You would lick that ice cream cone. How do you lick an ice cream cone? You lick it with your tongue. And the scripture says that when the fire fell, not only did it consume everything, but it licked up the water. And interesting enough that in Acts 2, when the power of God came, guess what happened? There appeared tongues of fire. And you know what the book of Isaiah tells us about? The tongue of God, his tongue is like a consuming fire. We just think in Hebrews it talks about our God being a consuming fire. But the scripture in the Old Testament in the book of Isaiah declares that God's tongue is like a fire. So guess what? In 1 Kings 18, the prophets of Baal did everything they could to get God's fire to fall. It didn't fall. There was no voice. But when the fire of God fell, the tongue of God was present. God's voice showed up. When God's voice shows up, there will always be a demonstration of His Spirit and power. And when the demonstration of God's Spirit and power took place in 1 Kings 18, when they all heard it, when they all saw it, when they heard the voice and they saw the power of God, that's when they fell on their face and said, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. Pastor, minister, evangelist, apostle, Prophet, I'm just here to tell you, tonight when I was praying, the Lord gave me a promise for some of you. And the Lord said this, and it may sound generic, but I know it's a promise for some specific people that are watching this tonight. God said if you would get on your face again, humble yourself, go back to praying and fasting like you used to do, that God would visit you again, and you once again would have His voice. Don't let any wet blankets tell you that you don't need to move of God every single Sunday. Don't let anybody tell you that you don't have to have revival every single Sunday. Listen, we haven't been having revival in our church services every single Sunday. We got our service from 11 to 12 because, my God, we got to let people out by that time because if they don't, they'll end up leaving. Listen, the reason we're in the situation we're in is because we have not contended for our move of God every time we gather. Listen, we've got to go after the thing of God. We've got to go after the power of God. We've got to go after revival. Somebody help me. Man, I remember hearing a pastor tell me one time as a young minister, as I was youth pastoring, it doesn't have to be a move of God every single Wednesday night, Brother Grady. Why does it not? Why do we have to limit that only God will move in certain times? It doesn't have to be every week. Anybody that's been used of God, anybody that's been, been a time of revival, has that been the mindset that they've had? That we only need a God, you know, God doesn't have to move every week. It's okay if you just preach a sermonette, stick the bottle in their mouth, burp them and send them home. It's okay. No! The reason we have the shape we're in is nobody's going after the voice. 
I don't care if you got the same 20 people in your pews as you did last Sunday and they all got saved. Preach so on fire that they have to come and get saved again. I don't care if they came and stood in the prayer line and you laid hands on every one of them and every one of them hit the floor. Do it every week. Contend for a move of God. The voice, whenever the voice of God comes through your mouth, when you hear Him, it releases the power of God. Three years it took for Elijah to have the word of the Lord. It came to him after many days. The Lord quickened me this afternoon when I was out on the phone with my brother who's going to be preaching tomorrow night. And the Lord showed me a glimpse of this. He said this, the Lord showed me this, that how Elijah had three years before he heard the word of the Lord and the power of God was demonstrated. That here the disciples were with on the earth with Jesus for three years. They saw different things. God used them. But when it was time for Jesus to be taken away, nobody stood up for him. And when Peter was asked or was said, hey, you were with him. Peter denied him three times. Could not even confess the name of Jesus. Could not even speak up for Jesus to a servant girl. And Peter went out and wept bitterly that Jesus is raised from the dead. And Jesus reaffirms Peter. And Jesus ascends into heaven and says, wait for the promise. And Peter goes through that wilderness experience of rejecting the Lord to a place called the upper room where he heard a voice. And when the sound, the voice of heaven came and filled him, when people accused him of being drunk, he spoke up. Why? Because he didn't just know about his Jesus. He didn't just know the word of God. He had his voice. He had a voice. He heard from heaven and he stood up and said, these men are not drunk as you suppose. And he preached Jesus to thousands of people and 3,000 people came to know Christ on that day. Why? What changed the atmosphere? What brought about the change? It was because Peter went through something. God emptied him through the denial, sent him to an upper room to hear a voice so he could release it in the earth and bring about a change to a multitude. My friend, the difference is, is that we've got to learn to hear from heaven. Many of us today need to get back into our upper room. We need to get back into our prayer closet. We need to push aside the TV, the Facebook. Many people are missing this quarantine time. My God, it's interesting to me that the same time that Pastor Jack was going to put on this revival. He called me Saturday and talked to me about this. And earlier that morning, the Lord told me that the next three weeks for my family, that three times a day, we'd push aside everything to seek the face of God. Morning, noon, and night. And so guess what at night what we're going to do is we're going to tune into this revival. We're going to go after God. And God is saying that we got about three weeks left in this quarantine. And some of you need to take advantage of the downtime. You need to sharpen the sword in fasting and prayer. Get your ear back to hearing the voice of God again. Listen to His voice so you can be a voice. Contend pastor. Contend preacher. Evangelists don't get bought out because they withhold an offering. Pastor, if they can vote you out, then God didn't call you there anyway. God will raise you up and raise up a people for you to lead that will contend for the same thing that you're contending for. I'm done with religious things. I'm done with religious people. They can say what they want to about me and you'd be okay with them saying what they want to about you because there's a day when we will stand before Jesus and will He be able to look at us and say, you contended and heard my voice and spoke what I said to you in secret or are you going to be able to stand before Jesus and hang your head in shame because you held back His voice? Who are you contending for? Who are you fighting for? Whose side are you on? In this hour, the Lord is drawing a line in the sand. Hear his voice. Listen, pastor, I know I've been preaching to pastors and preachers. Please hear me. Contend for his voice. I pray God's grace upon you right now to contend for his voice. I pray God's grace. I pray God's grace. I come against the enemy's condemnation. I come against people who have given you church hurt. I pray that God would heal that and God would shut the mouth of the lions and that you would stand up with a new boldness. When you stand behind your pulpit again, when God releases and opens this church up again, you will preach with his voice. 
I want you right now, wherever you're at, I want you to lift your hands. I want you to lift your hands to the Lord. And I want you to begin to intercede. I want you to begin to pray. If this pastor, if you're watching today, and this is speaking to you and it's convicting you, just get on your face. Make an altar. Contend for heaven. I pray God's blessings on you. I pray that the fear of man be stripped off you. That you wouldn't worry about their opinion. You wouldn't seek their approval. You would seek God's opinion and His approval. And that would be the only thing that would matter to you. That you would fall in love with Jesus again. And you would humble yourself and fast and pray again. So that once again, His voice will come to you. And you can be a voice in the earth. I pray God's blessings and favor on you. I pray God's grace upon you. I pray right now upon the armor bearers that are watching and holding up the arms of men of God. I pray God's blessings on you. I pray God's favor and strength upon you. I'm asking that as you intercede for your pastor, that not only will he be a voice, but God would use you as a voice to the man of God. Can I tell you right now, church, I'm back. I'm going from praying to preaching again. Stick with me. There are many lay people right now. You say, well, this doesn't apply to me. Uh, you know, my pastor needs the voice. Yes, but you know what? You do too. Because in the last day, says God, God said, I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. The sons and the daughters will prophesy. Guess what? A prophetic people are a people who now had to hear the voice and replicate what they hear. Can I tell you, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is not just about speaking in tongues, but because before they spoke in tongues in Acts 2, they heard a sound from heaven. Do you know what prophetic people do? They hear the sound from heaven, and they release with their mouth what God is saying. Listen, you may not be a pastor. You may not have the title of apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. I don't care. But you are to be a prophetic people, and you are to lift up your voice and speak into the earth, because the earth needs His voice. The pastor and the ministry leader is the voice to the body of Christ that equips the saints for the work of service. And the saints are to be a prophetic people who hear his voice. So God, I pray upon every church member, every lay person, I am praying for the anointing of the Spirit and the grace of God right now for you to be able to hear the voice of God. That just like the pastor needs to get in his prayer closet and wait and hear from heaven, that you would get in your prayer closet. You'd get in your upper room. You'd get in the widow's house. And you'd pray and you'd fast and you'd hear God's voice for yourself. And when the unction comes upon you, you will be a voice to this earth. I pray for God's grace for the people of God to no longer watch the work of the ministry, but that they would actually do the work of the ministry. I pray that people would not just share Jesus from a track or they wouldn't just share Jesus out of the scripture they've memorized, but from the unction that flows, this river of living water would flow and people would begin to speak as a voice from heaven. My God, I need you to linger. I need you to linger. I want you to linger. I feel the anointing of the Spirit. I feel like God is just wanting people to just kind of wait and linger and hover. That the Holy Spirit is hovering over people right now. I feel the anointing on my hands. I'm going to lay my hands on these phones that are, I got two phones going. Both of them, one's my Facebook page, one is the page for the revival. I'm going to pray over everybody who's watching right now for the anointing of the Holy Spirit to come upon them to be a laborer. This morning, my prayer closet, my kids and I and my wife, we cried out for God to raise up laborers. I pray you go forth as a laborer and one who carries the voice. As one who is a voice, who has the voice. That you would be one who is a voice who has His voice. One that is a voice who has His voice. Voice, I pray that upon you in the name of Jesus. Be his voice, be his voice. I don't feel like I, I don't really feel like I have anything else to preach, but I don't feel like we're supposed to let off right now. Just let, keep your hands lifted, just like this. If you can prop your phone up, I want you to put your hands up just like mine. Mirror what I'm doing. Mirror my hands. I pray God will give you insight in what it really means to bury your head in the hay.
I felt like, this is weird, I felt like the Lord showed me a picture of God's people. God's people, not just pastors, but God's people. Like an ostrich burying their head in the sand. And not worrying about coming up. It's like the Lord showed me that you're actually like, you're burying your head in that sand. You're not getting any air. And you stay there till you can't get any air. Till you actually, you pretty much die. You're dying to yourself. Whenever you're in that prayer closet, you feel like you need to come up because it's getting too uncomfortable. When you don't feel like you need to be praying, you need to pray past the point of when you don't, when you feel it anymore. I feel like in the prayer closet, there's going to be a crucifixion that God's going to have you stay there longer than what you would have on your own ability and your own want to. And it's going to kill something in you. Bury your head in a place where you will stay there until God empties you, until God kills the thing in you that needs to die. When that happens, you'll be a voice. There's hobbies that are not necessarily sin, but they need to die in your life tonight. There's time spent on TV and radio and Facebook and media that needs to die. It needs to be surrendered to the Lord tonight. There are business people. Your business is your idol. Your business is your idol. Let me just say this. The time you have devoted to your business and your, the time you have neglected towards God is proof that your business is your idol. It's better to let the work go by default than your prayer life to go by neglect, my friend. I pray God's grace upon you to be able to embrace in prayer that which needs to die in your life. When you bury your head in that sand, when you bury your head in the hay, when you're shut in with God, let Him suffocate everything that needs to die. In Jesus' name, amen. Tonight, you heard a message called The Voice. I believe that I spoke as one who had the voice of God as a voice. I challenge you to get, I challenge you to be a voice who has His voice. God bless you. We will see you tomorrow night, 7 p.m. A dear brother of mine is going to be preaching. I'll be sharing on my Facebook, her personal Facebook page, a watch party. Don't miss. We're going to hear. Let me tell you, if you're going to wonder if anybody's going to bring a voice, I know what he's talking on. I know what he's preaching on. I promise you. And every time I've heard this brother preach, he's preached as a voice that had God's voice. And you don't want to miss tomorrow night. God bless you. We will see you again soon.